Okay, great. We're very excited today um, to welcome Dr. James Pearson. He's an MRC CDA Research Fellow at the Division of Infection and Immunity um, at the University of Cardiff. Uh, he's a principal investigator there. And, um, you know, just a little bit about him. He's uh, he's brought some really interesting ideas, ideas to bear regarding circadian rhythms um, on the immune system in type 1 diabetes and how it pertains to screening. We were just recently at the ADA. We heard a talk by Linda DiMeglio on how uh, these autoantibody rhythms are uh, involved, uh, should be uh, considered in screening. And he's also sort of part of that consortia who's driving that. Uh, and and just, just just a little shout out to him. He's, he's, he's well-funded by the Steve Morgan Foundation. So um, hats off to that. Uh, he brought that in with his uh, innovative research, and um, that's uh, that's really quite uh, impressive. I would also say, you know, he's been conducting research in the immunology of type 1 diabetes since 2011. His research focuses on understanding how immune cell interactions alter the susceptibility to T1D with the aim of developing novel areas of research that can be translated for preventative T1D therapies. And I'll let him elaborate on this, but his research can kind of been can be divided into three main areas of investigation. One, understanding how antigen expression, co-receptors, and microbiota can modulate insulin reactive CD8 T cell functions to identify potential opportunities for development of prevention, preventative therapies. Two, understanding innate cell responses and interactions with the microbiome and how that influences susceptibility to T1D. And three, understanding the role of circadian rhythms and how they influence interactions between the microbiome and the innate and adaptive immune um, cells uh, in susceptibility to T1D. I'll drop a couple of his paper, recent papers in the chat and uh, you can have a look at those. Um, but welcome, um, James. Thank you so much for joining us. This is really, I'm really have been looking forward to this talk. Uh, thank you very much, Monica. It's really lovely to be invited uh, to talk about the work that we, uh, we've we been doing here. And, and I hope everyone's not too exhausted from the ADA because there's some great uh, research being presented there as well. Um, so as Monica mentioned, I, I've been interested in uh, circadian rhythms in type 1 diabetes. Um, quite recently, actually. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a bit about that today. So um, so just so uh, everyone's on sort of board with where we're looking at, um, after anyone eats food, that food gets broken down into glucose. Um, that glucose travels around our body in the blood and at high levels, uh, it can actually rec uh, be recognized by cells within our pancreas that we call beta cells. And those beta cells themselves will then start to make insulin in response to that high glucose. Uh, that insulin then travels around the bloodstream where it acts as a key that allows uh, glucose into those cells to use as an energy source. The issue in, in type 1 diabetes is that there's some sort of damage, and, and we still don't really know yet what that damage is or how it starts, uh, but there's some sort of damage which results in the recruitment of a number of different types of immune cells, which in turn uh, lead to the destruction of those insulin producing beta cells. So in response to glucose uh, in the circulation, there are fewer beta cells that can make insulin. And that means that there's a higher uh, level of glucose within the circulation um, because there's less insulin available to, to allow the uptake into cells. Um, so those people with type one have to you know, routinely inject themselves multiple times a day um, um, in order to, to survive. So what, why are we interested in, in circadian rhythms and, and what does it have to do with type 1 diabetes? Well, circadian rhythms generally refer to changes in gene or protein expression, or they can refer to physiological changes or even behavioral changes, um, which occur sort of approximately every 24 hours. And in the context of type 1, um, we know that we eat food when we're awake, and that means that we're going to get a bolus of glucose from that food being released, um, which can then mean our beta cells might be working uh, harder in order to produce insulin. And we know that the secretion of insulin is very much time of day controlled to when we are actively eating. But what we don't know is, well, what about the immune cells that target those beta cells? And, and as insulin itself is an autoantigen that's targeted by the immune cells, we really want to know um, is there any time of day changes occurring in the immune system that could result in uh, damage to those beta cells differently depending on the time of day? 
So uh, as Monica sort of alluded to, um, I've got a, a number of areas I'm interested in, and, and even within the circadian rhythm area, uh, we are interested in the influence that time of day has on the B cells that make antibodies and that secrete autoantibodies. And, and uh, Linda Meglio presented this very nicely at ADA on Friday. Um, we're interested in the circadian rhythms and how those regulatory T cells that work to stop the inflammatory T cells, um, how circadian rhythms influence Tregs. And uh, as we're also interested in the, in the T cell and B cell communication and how um, the time of day and, and how hard those beta cells are working might actually make them more uh, susceptible to being attacked by autoreactive T cells. Um, and our, you know, our overall hypothesis for all of this is that circadian rhythms or the time of day are really modulating susceptibility to, um, to how the immune system is causing damage. Uh, so the regulatory T cell side, which you know, works to try and stop the development of type 1 diabetes um, is often um, often struggles to cope with the pressures uh, leading to the destruction of type 1 diabetes. And, and we know in mouse models that the regulatory T cells themselves don't really survive very well. There's not enough generated. Uh, and they also have reduced T cell receptor diversity. So that might mean that they're not getting activated um, in advance of being able to control any sort of infl inflammation. In humans, we know that there's a reduction in the frequency of these regulatory T cells, so there's less there, or they might even not work very well. Uh, and that's been studied in a number of different um, publications. Um, and we know part of the reason why T regs don't work very well is linked to genetic susceptibility, um, of which we've got the IL-2 receptor alpha locus, uh, which is the, the main uh, high affinity receptor that IL-2 would be binding to. And Tregs have uh, this IL-2 receptor alpha, uh, a high, um, a high, um, uh, at a high level. So they're more likely to use the IL-2 in circulation. Um, and we also know uh, that some of the cytokines, the IL-10, which is often anti-inflammatory, uh, as well as CTLA-4, which is part of the way that the immune cell, uh, the regulatory T cells, stop T cell being activated. Uh, also have um, changes within uh, the genetics that can make those Tregs less effective. So we really need to find ways to improve how these regulatory T cells are working. So at the moment in humans, we know there are two different ways that you can um, try and boost these regulatory T cells. One is by administering what we call exogenous IL-2. So you give someone um, IL-2. Uh, and we know that the regulatory T cells will respond. They've got the alpha uh, IL-2 receptor, which is the high affinity, so they're gonna be more likely to bind IL-2 uh, compared to conventional T cells. Um, but the problem is that there's been evidence of uh, variable responses to IL-2 being administered, um, and there's the potential for activation of other immune cells as well. So it's not 100% uh, effective um, at the moment. The other side of the sort of Treg targeting side is to try and either expand your regulatory T cells that are present in your body uh, by taking them out and trying to grow them in the lab. Um, or the other option is that you take out cells and make them become regulatory T cells as conversion. Uh, and data has shown that these are um, these regulatory T cell expansions are actually quite safe. Um, a year later, up to 25% of those that were injected can still be identified. Um, it can help preserve insulin secretion from those beta cells. And in one of the studies, um, two out of the 10 patients didn't require any insulin uh, four to five months after uh, the transfer of these cells. Um, so there is this window where, you know, if you can get the regulatory T cells functioning better, you can actually um, protect those beta cells for longer. But in both of these avenues, there's not really been any time of day consideration to the IL-2 responses and what cells could use the IL-2 at that time, or how or what time of day might be best to expand these regulatory T cells. We know from literature um, that the time of day really does make a difference to how regulatory T cells work. Um, on the paper on the left from Julie Gibbs lab at the University of Manchester, we know that um, 
the regulatory T cells are brought into the inflamed joint of mice that have rheumatoid arthritis, and they're brought in at one time of day over another, and that's linked to changes within the dendritic cells. Um, and we also know on the paper on the right from uh, Christophe Benoit and Diane Mathis' group um, that the regulatory T cells within the fat also have time of day changes um, in how they are functioning and in their metabolism as well. So, so we know that time of day makes a difference in both rheumatoid arthritis and in um, sort of um, adiposity, but we don't know much about how time of day influences these regulatory T cells in type 1 diabetes. Uh, and we also want to be able to use this knowledge in order to take advantage of when we give therapy. So the data that I'm going to talk to you about today uh, comes predominantly from a non-obese diabetic mouse. Um, when we use this as a model for human type 1 diabetes as uh, our mice develop spontaneous autoimmune diabetes. And you can see here on the left, uh, our female uh, in pink develop around 70 to 80% um, spontaneous diabetes whereas our males develop around 10 to 20 percent, so they do develop less uh, diabetes than females. Uh, this sex difference is not seen in human type 1 diabetes. Um, this is just something that is in our mouse model. Uh, but the mice really do have strengths in the, um, the, the way that they have similar genetics and environmental factors that can shape susceptibility to type 1 diabetes in these mice. So they do provide us with a model where we can try and prevent the development of type 1 diabetes and also study tissues that are not as accessible as they are in humans. Um, so in our studies, uh, what I'm going to show you is that we've got some data from our six week of age mice, uh, which is before these mice develop type 1 diabetes. We've got some data from mice that uh, developed diabetes, um, and we've also managed to age and sex match uh, our data to these diabetic mice. And, um, so these mice that are aged and sex matched and non-diabetic. And we've also studied mice right at the end of our observation period at 35 weeks. Um, and these are mice that haven't developed diabetes during uh, our observation period. At each of these um, groups, we're really looking at male and female mice. We're looking at four different time points. Uh, we've got two time points where the lights are on in the room, but the mice are sleeping. And then we've got two time points where the mice are active and the lights are off. And we've taken a number of different tissues from these mice, but what I'm predominantly going to talk about today is the data from the pancreatic lymph nodes, which are the draining lymph nodes for the pancreas. So any immune cells often have to go via the pancreatic lymph nodes to enter the pancreas. So the first thing we wanted to do was to actually look at our regulatory T cells in uh, young mice. So this is the data from six week old mice. We've got representative flow cytometry plots. So here we've got male on the, the top row and female on the bottom. We've got CD25 on the Y axis versus FOXP3 on the X axis. And we're calling uh, Tregs CD25 positive and FOXP3 positive. Um, and here at the, the end column, we've just got our controls, which are isotype or our uh, FMO control, just to help us gate where we think these um, population of T rates are. When you compile all this data, uh, you can see that over the course of, of the day, um, whether you're looking at in uh, pink in females or blue in males, there's this reduction in the proportion of regulatory T cells where they're highest in the morning and they tend to be lowest in the evening. And this was significantly different within our female mice uh, and was just shy of significance within our male mice. Uh, but when you combine them, you get quite a, a significant um, time of day change. Uh, and the way that we're calculating our um, time of day changes, we're using a circadian um, statistic that we're calling a, a JTK cycle analysis. Um, and that allows us to compare all our time points uh, but it also corrects for the number of comparisons that we're doing using uh, an FDR correction. Uh, and this is why we're presenting the data with Q values. So knowing that we had these time of day changes in our young mice, we then want to know, well, what about older mice or mice with, with type 1 or mice that were protected from type 1? Um, and what we found within our diabetic mice was that we didn't really see any time of day change. Um, and interestingly, we, we also didn't see it within our age matched non-diabetic mice. Um, and that kind of, uh, there's a caveat with this, uh, because in our NOD mice, um, we don't know which of these mice that we're calling age-matched and non-diabetic 
could have actually progressed on to develop type 1 diabetes a couple of days later or even a couple of weeks later. So we don't know at what stage uh, of disease development these age-matched non-diabetic mice were, and that could be masking some of the difference we could have found uh, without that sort of um, confounder. Uh, but either way, um, matching them to age-matched mice that were non-diabetic, there, there wasn't a time of day change. And similarly, if you look at the end of the observation period where these are mice that haven't developed diabetes during that whole duration, again, we, while well, we found a slight trend um, matching the six week age group, it didn't reach significance when we did the comparisons. So there's really something about that young pre-diabetic period where we're seeing rhythmicity in, in those uh, regulatory T cell abundance. So, so why might they have that? So we kind of, for many different ways to sort of test that would allow us to say, well, are there more regulatory T cells in the morning because of a various number of factors? And, and the first one we addressed was whether or not apoptosis, so the, the cell death of these regulatory T cells was altered by time of day. Um, to do this, we used an XM5 staining uh, with a viability marker. And you can see that uh, in the bottom left quadrant, these would be cells that would be healthy and, and, and very much alive. Um, in this top left quadrant, we've got cells that are in the early death stage. Uh, in the top right, we've got cells that are sort of in the late death stage. And in the bottom right in Q3, we're talking about cells that have actively died. Uh, and you can see in, in this, we found pretty much a, uh, no time of day changes. They're pretty stable, regardless of what time you harvest these uh, regulatory T cells from the pancreatic lymph node. But what's interesting, and, and this might explain why sometimes the regulatory T cells don't work very well, they're actively in an early stage of death. So it wouldn't take very much for them to, to effectively become exhausted uh, and basically not be able to cope with the, the mounting pressure. So given that we knew apoptosis wasn't responsible for why we're getting this time of day change, we then asked, well, what about the regulatory T cells? Could they be expanding at one time of day over another? And could that be contributing to the abundance changes we're seeing? Um, so initially, we began this by looking at an intranuclear marker called KI67, and this is just a marker for uh, proliferation. Uh, and you can see that we've got the gating here at all the four different time points. And if you look at the plot at the bottom, you can see that there's a steady decline in the KI67 staining, which when you combine males and females, um, you get a, a, a p-value a that's just over uh, the 0 0.05 value. So there's potentially here some time of day changes in the ability for those regulatory T cells to expand. Um, but because this is directly uh, taken from the mice, we don't know what degree of activation they might have received already and whether that could alter whether or not a, a regulatory T cell is more likely to expand. So to test that, we're, we're doing some in vitro proliferation assays that are currently underway where we're isolating these regulatory T cells from the pancreas drain lymph nodes and we're stimulating them um, in order to activate their T-cell receptor using anti-CD3 and then providing a secondary signal uh, of activation through uh, anti-CD28 to, to activate those cells. And if we can see uh, that there's a better expansion after activation in the morning versus evening, we'll know that there is some contribution for the expansion of these cells naturally. Uh, we also were interested in whether these cells were moving to the pancreas, and we looked at a number of markers, including LPAM1, which is an alpha 4 beta 7 integrin. And this is an important marker that is expressed on T cells that allows them to gain entry into the pancreas. Um, and what we found here was that the expression of this marker as a proportion on regulatory T cells in the pancreas draining lymph node actually goes up uh, at the time that the cells are beginning to go down. So it could be that we're getting more trafficking of these regulatory T cells to the pancreas, uh, and we're confirming this uh, by histological analysis. Um, um, so hopefully we'll get some nice data to share uh, in the near future about that as well. The other part of what we were interested in is, is sort of in line with this expansion of the regulatory T cells, but thinking more about, well, what about those naive CD4 cells that might become regulatory T cells? Um, something that we call T-reg differentiation. So those naive CD4s are differentiating into regulatory T cells. So what we've done is we've isolated naive CD4s from the pancreas draining lymph node of our six-week-old mice, 
And we've done this either at 7 a.m. or 7 p.m. And the reason for that is that at 7 a.m., that's where we're seeing our highest abundance of regulatory T cells. And at 7 p.m., we're seeing uh, one of our lowest abundances uh, of regulatory T cells. So we want to know, you know, if we harvest them at these two different times of day, does it make a difference in how well those naive cells become regulatory T cells? And, and they're stimulated with MCD3 uh, and in the presence of, of differentiation media, which is commercially provided, uh, but includes things like IL-2, retinoic acid, TGF-beta. And what we found when we've looked at this and we've evaluated this every day after stimulation of the cells. So at day zero, you can see that when we look at our FOXP3 and CD25 double positive cells, we really don't have any at, at, at day zero, which shows that our isolation of those cells has worked really nicely. But at day one, we begin to see more double positive. By day two and day three, we see pretty much uh, almost all the cells have become regulatory T cells, and that's continued into day four and day five. But when you look at the, the difference between a morning and an evening harvest on those um, naive cells to become regulatory T cells, we really see at day one, two, and three that the morning harvests, uh, those cells are more likely to become regulatory T cells faster than, um, than if you take those cells at 7 p.m. Uh, and I should say that each of these dots uh, is from a single experiment uh, that is often uh, required at least four mice to be pooled in order to get enough cells to do this experiment. Um, so it is quite reproducible as well. So, so we basically knew that the naive cells differentiating into regulatory T cells was occurring more in the morning, and that seemed to uh, coincide with this increase in abundance at 7 a.m over 7 p.m. So we're, we're kind of certain that there is something going on in vivo that allows these cells to become regulatory T cells. So the environment is more uh, able to promote regulatory T cells. We were also interested in other protein expression on these cells. Um, we found CD28 in our six week old group was significantly altered by time of day. So here we, it matches pretty much the same as the abundance where the higher the T-reg abundance, the higher expression of CD28. And as time goes by, we see a reduction in the expression of CD28. Uh, and CD28 is also important because it controls the differentiation of these regulatory T cells, uh, of naive cells into regulatory T cells as well. Um, I've mentioned LPAM1 and KO67 as well. Uh, the only other difference we found within our group was in our mice that didn't develop type 1 diabetes at the end of our observation period at 35 weeks of age. Uh, they also had uh, significant uh, proliferation in their regulatory T cells at different times of day. And this was lost in, in, in all our diabetic and age-matched mice. Um, and the other marker we found, which was interesting, was CD73. Uh, and this is an important marker on the cell surface because it works to convert um, ATP uh, with CD39 into uh, adenosine, which is quite immunosuppressive. So it actually sort of limits the activation of, of uh, T cells and helps try and prevent any sort of uh, immune-mediated damage. Um, and you can see here that the proportion of the CD73 on these regulatory T cells uh, was higher when the mice were in their resting period compared to when uh, they were active and it actually went down during that period. Um, so given that CD73 was important in uh, mediating suppression, we wanted to know, does this, could this mean that the regulatory T cells function differently depending on if they're taken out of the mice in the morning versus in the evening. So in order to test that, we did an in vitro Treg suppression assay uh, where we're using uh, a BDC 2.5 CD4 positive T cell. Uh, what this means is it's a CD4 T cell clone that recognizes an ILA antigen within those beta cells that make insulin. And in this case, it's recognizing this hybrid um, antigen between chromogranin A and insulin. And if the cells become active with this peptide or even see it within the islets, um, they can very quickly transfer diabetes into uh, immunocompromised mice. Um, so the assay setup, we have our BDC 2.5 cells. We've labeled them with a dye in order to track how many times they proliferated. Uh, we've cultured them with antigen presenting cells that are presenting our antigen. Uh, but in some cases, we don't have any antigen there just to see what our background proliferation is. And we're also adding in or not our regulatory T cells. And these were from, again, the pancreas-straining lymph node to work out how capable they are of suppressing 
um, the BDC 2.5 cells from proliferating to their beta cell derived antigen. Uh, and these cells were cultured for four days. So here you can see our, our sort of representative flow cytometry plots where we're looking at CFDA as our, our dye on those BDC 2.5 T cells that recognize those antigens in the islet. And you can see that each round of division, you see a slightly different colored circle. And this just indicates that these cells have at least undergone four different rounds of division um, in response to 50 nanograms per mil of, of peptide. You can see less uh, proliferation with the lower dose of peptide, and you do get a little bit of background with uh, no peptide being presented. But when you look at the data and you work out, well, compared to without having any uh, regulatory T cells there, what happens when you add the regulatory T cells in in the morning or into the evening? And if you look at the lower dose, we get suppression by those regulatory T cells in the morning, but we really fail to get any suppression at the lower dose in the evening. And actually, it almost seems that they're promoting the uh, proliferation of these uh, BDC 2.5 cells. Um, and if you look at the higher dose, again, 7 a.m. is uh, the T regs from the pancreas draining lymph node at 7 a.m. are much better at suppressing um, the proliferation of those autoreactive T cells, uh, while 7 p.m. is a lot less able to suppress um, the activation of those cells. So we know that the time of day is making a difference to their ability to suppress um, the autoimmune process. And what was interesting with that, when we look at the regulatory T cells in those cultures, we found that the level of CD25, uh, which is the IL-2 receptor, uh, was highly expressed uh, in the morning. It was still relatively high expressed in the evening, but almost half the amount of expression uh, at the lower dose and a slightly lower reduction um, in the uh, higher peptide concentration. But in both cases, the Tregs at the 7 a.m. have a higher expression of CD25 in the culture after four days than the BDC. So they might be better at sequestering any uh, IL-2 within the uh, culture system. And we're in the process at the moment, uh, I've actually set up the ELISA, so I'll be doing that tomorrow, of measuring the um, culture supernatants for things like IL-2, uh, our anti-inflammatory cytokines like IL-10, IL-35, TGF-beta, but also looking at readouts for uh, inflammatory uh, BDC 2.5 cells, such as interferon and TNF-alpha, which we hope will be better reduced in the morning uh, compared to those uh, cells that were uh, cultured in the evening. Um, the other thing to say is that we're also going to be measuring adenosine, which is the uh, outcome of that CD73 that we already found had uh, time of day changes as well. And this should give us an idea of, of potentially how this uh, time of day change in the ability to suppress inflammatory T cells is, is working. Um, so knowing that we've got some functional changes, we've got differences in the expansion of the cells, we've got differences in uh, their ability to suppress, we kind of then want to know, well, what is happening to these cells? Why are they behaving differently? And, and to do that, we, we decided we would do an RNA microarray, looking at the genetic, uh, the gene changes at different times of day. Um, and to do that, we've used uh, one of our clever mice. Uh, this is a, uh, a FOXP3 uh, enhanced green fluorescent protein reporter mouse. Um, so what this means is our regulatory T cells express FOXP3. It's um, an intranuclear marker that, is, uh, that determines if that cell is a Treg. Uh, but unfortunately, you can't pull out FOXP3 positive cells normally because with it being in the nucleus, as soon as you try and open up the cell to, to stain FOXP3, um, the cells die. So using this reporter system, we can actually pull out our green positive cells uh, that are regulatory T cells uh, from our pancreas draining lymph nodes, and we can sort them at different times of day to look at how those genes within those regulatory T cells change. So what we found was that a third of the genes that were uh, present in our regulatory T cells were significantly altered by time of day compared to uh, two thirds that were not altered uh, by time of day. And what was interesting, if you look at the upstream regulators, so what could be driving those gene changes, IL-2 is actually the second highest uh, upstream regulator in these gene changes. Uh, and as I've mentioned, uh, we know that there are uh, IL-2 is very important clinically. 
Uh, and this is just showing an example of that, where if you give low dose IL-2 to individuals, uh, newly diagnosed individuals with type 1, and look at the change in uh, regulatory T cell abundance, um, you can see here that you get this dichotomy, you get some individuals that have a high uh, response, their T rates respond well, they almost double in the proportion that are present, whereas we've got this group of, of individuals that unfortunately don't seem to respond very well to, to the IL-2 and they, they're not increasing their regulatory T cells. But the other problem with it is that you're getting increased activation of, of inflammatory cells, uh, either CD8 T cells or, or even NK cells, which can lead to the secretion of uh, inflammatory mediators like granzyme B. So while this is a, being trialed as a therapy in type 1, there are still some potential issues we need to address in order to, to make sure that this is going to be available for everyone and, and will work as well as it can do. And obviously from our data, knowing that IL-2 is driving some of these gene changes uh, depending on uh, the time of day, we really wanted to know, would targeting the regulatory T cells at one, day over an, at one time a day over another result in differential ability to expand the regulatory T cells, differences in how they worked, and would it also result in a reduction in, in sort of these uh, inflammatory immune cells uh, being activated and producing uh, molecules that could actually be detrimental to trying to protect uh, the individuals from type 1 diabetes. So what we did was we administered uh, a complex of, of IL-2 uh, and an antibody to IL-2. And the reason for giving this complex rather than IL-2 alone was IL-2 alone, if you administer it uh, to mice, within about two to four hours, the IL-2 is completely removed from circulation. Whereas if you give it with the anti-IL-2, it will prolong the uh, duration that the IL-2 is in circulation for. Uh, and here, what you can see is if you give that low-dose IL-2 in the morning, you can sort of double the proportion of regulatory T cells. But if you give that complex in the evening, you can almost triple the proportion of our regulatory T cells uh, compared to the control. So you can see that there is potential for targeting those regulatory T cells in the evening when we know that they're at lower abundance, they're not functioning as well. So maybe by giving low dose R2 here, we can actually improve how well they're working and expand them so that we don't have this window of time where the immune cells are more likely to take advantage and, and drive inflammation. James, uh, can I just quickly qualify that this is uh, mouse or human in this particular yes. study? Uh, this is mouse in this study. Okay. Yeah. Sorry yeah, for, so, for not clarifying that. No um, worries. Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, say, so So if you were thinking about a study in a, cl a human, human cl cl um, clinical um, trial, you would consider the reverse, right? Because that's the yeah. night day cycle of the mouse. Yeah, exactly. And I think that there's a lot more complexity with humans in general, because uh, unlike the mice that are in a defined environment um, and they're all genetically similar, mm -hmm. humans obviously have a greater variation. So I think there's a lot to do there to understand, you know, does the chronotype in terms of, you know, is someone a morning person versus an evening person, does that affect their, their changes in these regulatory T cells as well and the response to therapy? So there's a lot we still don't know. Right. Um, we're hoping to be able to address this through uh, the funding uh, that has been very kindly provided through the Grand Challenge I mean, Insights funding from the Steve Morgan Foundation, um, uh, working very closely alongside Breakthrough T1D and Diabetes UK. And I just kind of want to give you an overview of what we're going to be doing with this. Um, oh, so this, this study started in January, um, where we're administering either the low-dose R2 complex in the morning or evening, or we're administering the low-dose IL-2 complex with a combination of anti-CD80 and anti-CD86. And the reason for that comes back to this abatacept paper from humans, where um, for those that don't know, abatacept is the CTLA-4 immunoglobulin. Uh, and the way that CTLA-4 works is it binds to CD80, CD86 on antigen-presenting cells. And the idea is if you can block CD80-86, it'll stop inflammatory T cells from getting activated. The problem was with abatacept that when you give it to individuals uh, with type one, you get this reduction after treatment with, in the abundance of regulatory T cells. So what we're hoping to do is by administering low dose IL-2 with the anti-CD86 uh, as a mimic to abatacept, 
we're hoping that we can basically restore the regulatory T cell back to their baseline level and make sure that we're not losing uh, the abundance of T regs that might help us better protect uh, the insulin producing beta cells. Um, we're giving this therapy every three days for four weeks. So we're starting at six weeks of age, which is when we're seeing these time of day rhythms in our mice. And the therapy will stop before uh, mice become diabetic because 10 weeks of age is really the earliest we see um, diabetes within our colony. We're going to be looking at a number of things as readouts. We're looking at how the Tregs are changed by flow cytometry. We're going to be looking at the Tregs within the pancreas. Um, we're going to be looking at um, the spatial uh, organization of those Tregs. Um, so does, for example, the treatment um, affect what cells those Tregs are interacting with within the lymph node and within the pancreas um, and what's happening at both the protein and, and transcript level and how is treatment and the time of day interacting together uh, to hopefully give us a, a more favorable response at one time of day. Uh, we're going to be performing our regulatory T-cell differentiation assays, so pulling out those naive CD4s and making them become Tregs and working out if we give therapy, do we ablate those time of day differences or do they do we still maintain them? And is it still better to give therapy at one time of day over another? Uh, and finally, we're hoping to really pull out um, the uh, Tregs from these mice uh, that are treated uh, in order to see if we can better suppress um, autoreactive T cells like the BDC 2.5 uh, CD4 T cell claim that I've mentioned previously. Wow, this is really a thorough and and really beautifully designed study. I have to compliment you on that. Yeah, thank you very much, Monica. We're, we're going to be looking at you know spontaneous diabetes development as a, as our obvious readout anyway. And again, we're trying to going to see if we can reverse diabetes with uh, these different treatments as well. So we're you know we're really trying to work out you know what happens to the time of day by administering therapy, and does it make a difference once the T regs have received therapy and how how likely are they going to respond to therapy? Is it better to target those regulatory T cells when they're at lower abundance and not functioning as well? Because in, in my mind, that's probably the time we want to do it. Um, but, you know, is there any disadvantage if we give it in the morning? Um, you know, are we then promoting more um, activation of other cells? And that's something that we're, we're going to be looking at within our phenotyping panels as well. Um, but luckily, we're not just doing this in mice. We're also then moving forward into our uh, into doing this in parallel in humans. So we're not doing any in vivo work in humans, um, and I'll, I'll explain what we are doing, but we're we're basically recruiting um, individuals with recent onset type 1, so that's anything less than one year post-diagnosis, and we're also looking at uh, what we're calling established type 1 diabetes, which is gener generally anything over the three years, uh, but actually we've had some people that we're, we, that we're calling intermediate that are between one and three years that we've also recruited uh, that are interested in the study. Um, these are all individuals with type 1. And what we're doing is we're taking a blood collection in the morning and we're taking a blood collection in the evening to look at the immune cells. Um, and generally speaking, we're doing this about 10 to 14 hours apart. So within the same day, they're coming in the morning, they're going about doing their normal business, whether they're work, whether they're doing studying, and then they're coming back in the evening to, to have a blood sample again. Uh, and similar to the mouse work, we're going to be looking at what's changed in those regulatory T cells by flow cytometry. We're going to be looking at the changes in those regulatory T cells from the gene expression level. And we're also interested, particularly uh, as why some people don't respond well to, to low dose IL-2. We really want to look at the, um, the IL-2 receptor uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, because if we can identify those individuals that might not respond very well to treatment, then we know... Um, that we might need to think differently about what treatment strategy they get early on. Because if you've got newly diagnosed people or people at risk and there's only a small window of opportunity to intervene, you need to know that those people are most likely to respond to therapy or not um, in order to maximize the time you've got to protect those insulin producing beta cells. Um, so with our immune cells, we're gonna be doing uh, in vitro cultures with our different therapy options. Um, and we're gonna be looking at, again, how do these therapies in vitro affect the ability to suppress uh, inflammatory T cells? How uh, does it affect the ability of naive CD4s to become regulatory T cells? Uh, and also, you know, what are they making in response uh, to these different therapies uh, in the morning and evening? And we're also measuring from uh, the plasma and serum 
uh, the cytokines that have been secreted uh, naturally in these people, uh, as well as uh, the autoantibodies that they might have, which again comes back to one of our interests in the group about time of day changes in uh, autoantibodies uh, abundance. So in the three months that this study has actively been recruiting, uh, we've recruited nine newly diagnosed individuals and we've got 11 individuals with established type 1, so we're already uh, a quarter of the way uh, to getting our final 80. Uh, and we've got five more individuals to recruit, um, two of which will take place tomorrow. We've got another two next week and then the week after we've got another individual already. So we're doing really well with recruitment, which is great. And it seems like a lot of people are really interested in, in time of day changes and wanting to know, you know what is happening to their immune cells at these times and, and whether it makes a difference to therapy. So yeah. in summary, what I- Just, I, just, a, just okay. a quick aside, I just have to compliment you on that recruitment. Um, that's a big obstacle mm. and uh, just, you know, hats off for that really quick uh, recruitment and, you know, implementation of this, uh, the study. Yeah, I, I, we've got some fantastic research nurses, so Alex and Shinto, both um, going out there trying to get as many people interested and involved. Uh, and we've also been advertising through different platforms that we weren't doing before. And it mm -hmm. seems that actually, you know, we're, we're able to get people that are interested that don't necessarily want to do a clinical trial but they're happy to donate their, their blood for research. Yeah, so, well, you know, well done. That's a really big part good. of, that's a really big part of the study. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Any uh, study. Mm -hmm. So, so in, in summary, what I hope to have shown you is that the time of day seems to affect uh, upstream. IL-2 seems to be playing a big role in this. Uh, we know that um, within our suppression assays, that CD25 was more highly expressed on the Tregs that were better at suppressing inflammatory T cells. We know that there are rhythmic changes within uh, the DNA uh, in a third of the genes within the regulatory T cells. We know that uh, from a suppression point of view that CD73 is altered at different times of day. And that seems to be the expression of which seems to correlate with when the cells are better or worse at uh, preventing autoreactive T cell proliferation. And we know that that suppression is also altered. We know that uh, expression of markers like LPAM1, which might lead to um, increased recruitment into the pancreas seems to be altered as well. And markers like CD28 that are important for driving the activation of the regulatory T cells, as well as uh, the naive CD4s becoming regulatory T cells. And we're hoping to understand how all of these changes occur at different times of day when we give therapy either in the morning or in the evening, either low dose R2 alone or low dose R2 with our, our mimic for a Batacept which is the anti-CD80, anti-CD86 approach. And, and the hope is within our, our bigger picture within the group that we can identify immune populations um, such as the T cells and see when they peak. And that would then give us an opportunity to try and target those T cells when they're at their peak inflammatory response. And there's a number of therapies now that are available that are showing fantastic promise um, in people at risk or in newly diagnosed individuals where you know, if we can target the uh, the cells at the right time, we might be able to lose use a lower dose, which makes it more cost effective, but also might also uh, reduce side effects that people experience during some of these treatments. Um, and likewise, if we target those regulatory T cells when they're at their lowest abundance, either through the administration of exogenous IL-2 or through adoptively transferring in regulatory T cells, the hope is that we can increase the support for those regulatory T cells when they're at their lowest time, meaning that there's less opportunity for the inflammatory T cells to cause damage. And, you know, as I've mentioned, this is just summarizing that we hope targeting those immune cells at the right time of day might improve clinical efficacy. It could help reduce variation between the individuals, particularly in, in clinical trials, and it could reduce those side effects. Um, and importantly, there was a paper in mice uh, published uh, a couple of weeks ago now um, showing that if you give mice that have tumors anti-PD-1, so a checkpoint inhibitor um, in the morning, um, uh, when the mice are awake, which, um, sorry, when the mice are awake, you can actually get better activation of those CD8 T cells and the destruction of the, uh, of the tumor. And therefore, we're now seeing evidence in vivo that giving therapy at one time a day over another actually has a, a substantial effect on the immune cells and in clearing, in this case, uh, tumors. Uh, but could also be applied to other settings, such as 
uh, type 1 diabetes. So uh, I just want to thank everyone who's been helpful, uh, all my group at Cardiff, so Catherine, uh, uh, so Katie, Joe, Kada, Shinto and Alex, who have all contributed to the work that I presented today. Uh, Steph and Michelle are just getting started on the project, looking at the spatial transcriptomic side and the histology side of, of what's happening um, to our mice that have received therapy. Um, I couldn't have got to where I am without Susan Wong's help, uh, as well as Lee Wen at Yale. Um, who have both supported me in, in developing me into becoming an independent PI. Um, Anne and Amanda have been great. They, they, Anne especially came in at weird times of day to do the sorting on the flow cytometer. So without her help, I wouldn't have been able to do that. Uh, and Amanda helped with the RNA microarray. Um, I should thank um, Craig, who's our long-term statistician help at Michigan, um, and as well as Lucy and, and Chen Jing at UCL, who uh, really started this um, low dose IL-2 uh, and CD80 and CD86 work in a, in a different mouse model um, and that we're now trying to apply it um, to our time of day change in uh, our NOD mice. Uh, I've got to thank all of our study participants that have been recruited um, and our local Diabetes UK support group who uh, have very kindly read multiple lay abstracts and helped us sort of tailor uh, some of our grant writing and have also been really interested in what we're doing, which is great. Um, we've got to thank all the funders. Um, this TREG work really started as an offshoot from the MRC funding that I've got. Um, it was picked up through a small grant award through uh, Breakthrough T1D or, or GDRF back then. Uh, and that led us to then use that small grant as a preliminary data to get this bigger Steve Morgan Foundation uh, funding. So, you know, without um, all of those steps, we wouldn't have got to where we are now, which I think is showing some some really interesting changes that we can certainly follow up um, in both our mice and in our human studies moving forward. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, James. Yeah, it's this is just absolutely cutting edge work. It's really interesting. And it was funny that you kind of tapped on that oncology because that was one of my questions for you is like, what is the sort of paradigm in the oncology field? Have they tapped into this? Um, idea of, you know, administering um, chemotherapy drugs in, in different uh, times of the day to kind of complement the circadian rhythms. Do you know much? I mean, was that a one-off paper? Is that, is that yeah. just the start of things or is, is there, are, is there known data in that, in the oncology field? Yeah. So, so that's sort of the first paper that I would say has been really convincing with the time of day mm -hmm. changes. Um, I think there's still a lot more to, to, to learn from it. But data, you know, even in humans, and you know, there's a couple of papers out there now in, in type one diabetes as well, um, that show that there are changes within uh, the blood of people with type one. Uh, Craig Beam and, and Linda actually with Mark Atkinson published that work uh, a couple of years ago in Diabetologia, uh, mm -hmm. and they show that there are these these sort of changes in the abundance of regulatory uh, of, of immune cells. What was really striking to me from that data, there were there were two things. When you compare the changes in the blood at different times of day uh, in those with type 1 to those uh, that don't have type 1. Um, the biggest change was in the dendritic cells. So the dendritic cells shift by about 12 hours. So they're now peaking at the time that the T cells are peaking, the B cells are peaking. So, you know, there's an obvious communication there that they're, they're coinciding um, their peak in the blood with the peak of those adaptive immune cells. So, you know, there's potential there to intervene. And, and that peak in the blood occurs overnight. And obviously we don't do any experiments overnight in people, generally speaking, but maybe if the DCs are so important for, for activating those T and B cells, maybe we should be thinking about targeting uh, some of those yeah. interactions overnight uh, in yeah. that period as well. Yeah, some kind of like slow release patch while you're sleeping or something. <clears throat> Here's another question. Um, can you comment on, um, you know, you, you specifically looked at the Tregs and you talked a little bit about dendritic cells. Has anyone gone about dissecting the impact on, of circadian rhythms on the other players in the immune cell? You know, the uh, NK cells, macrophages, the other flavors of CD8, CD4. Yes, yes. So, so there's a lot out there in, in other fields. You know, macrophages are often the most studied uh, immune cell for things like circadian rhythms. Um, a lot of the innate immune cells, so macrophages, DCs, uh, ILCs, 
Uh, you're going to find circadian rhythms in those NK cells as well. Um, so that they are definitely there. What I would say is that I don't think for us, the regulatory T cell side, um, that it's an, an intrinsic change. It's mm -hmm. definitely driven instead by uh, an extrinsic uh, factor. And in our case, it looks like it might be uh, low dose IL-2 or at least IL-2 um, and some data that I've not presented, um, which is interesting and we're still trying to work out exactly how it's doing it. Um, uh, the response to uh, cholesterol, mm. it seems one of the most upregulated genes on our regulatory T cells uh, that have time of day changes is the low density lipoprotein receptor. And, you know, so, so there might be some sort of immunometabolism side of this where the cells are responding to something that they're, they're, they're using that as an energy source and then they're able to respond to whatever threat or, or challenge there is. Um, so we're in the process of sort of working through that as well. But I would definitely say it's, it's extrinsic. Um, and I think that there are a role for circadian rhythm in all of the immune cells that we study. And in type one, we just haven't really pulled it apart yet. We don't know how they right. behave. And in humans, like I say, the only data we've got is that the, the peak in the blood seems to be different in those people with a type one compared to those without. So that's already suggesting that there is some important sort of uh, collaboration between these immune cells at different times of day that is different and not there in uh, people that don't have type one. So it's definitely a, a field that I'm hoping more people will be interested in, in understanding, um, uh, not only from sort of a basic science point of view, but how we can then use that to our advantage for therapy, because that's really oh. where the strength lies. Yeah, it really is. And it, I'm sure you know about that paper from Karsten Bouchard's group, um, where he used the phenofibrate to, uh, almost anecdotal, but it's a sort of a one-off patient uh, to reverse or to keep a patient in, really to keep a patient in um, remission for longer, extend the honeymoon. Uh, so that's kind of interesting that you bring up that LDL receptor on the Tregs, curious. Um, and then I did want to ask you just two more questions. I know we're short on time. One um, is, you know, what is the, we, we, you really didn't touch on cortisol, but mm -hmm. I mean, it, I, and I don't want to open up like, I may, we, we may have to have a second talk with you, but with cortisol, like what's the backdrop of cortisol in, in what you've got, uh, what you've seen so far? Yeah. So let me see if I can open it up and then I can share the data that we've got for cortisol because it's, I didn't put it in the presentation, but uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, because we do see time of day dependent changes in, in serum cortisol. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we see it in corticosterone, we see it with aldosterone, we see it with IGF-1. So we're mm -hmm. seeing it in a lot of factors within the circulation. So trying to pull apart what one thing is doing over everything else when all of them are, are doing things slightly different. Um, let me just see if I can uh, show you. So, I mean, once so you establish this landscape, it's going to be so... Um... Uh, it's going to be, a, a, you know, something so helpful for the field. Yeah. And... yeah so... Okay, yes, here you so go. This is, so this is the cortisol data. It's in PRISM. So uh, but you can see that when our T-Rogues are peaking, which is at 7 a.m., mm -hmm. um, they go down the course of the day. Cortisol generally goes down as well. Mm -hmm. so, so there is some sort of link there, but we don't know yet what the cortisol could be doing to the regulatory T-cells. And, right. and like I say, given that there were, uh, other molecules like the LDL receptor, we kind of became interested in, in that side of things. And, and we know that circulating LDL peaks at the same time that the uh, gene expression is highest in the Tregs and at the highest abundance of Tregs. So all three of those things are peaking at the same time uh, and going down at the same time. So, you know, there's some sort of interaction there, but what right. it means to function uh, survival, you know, they're, they're questions that we're sort of working for at the moment. One more layer of understanding. Um, and then just really briefly, and we may circle back to you uh, for a second talk, because the other component of what you're looking at is the microbiome. Yeah. And the work you've done with the microbiome, its uh, impact with circadian rhythms and uh, islet autoimmunity, mm -hmm. sort of like overlay, you know, the, obviously, the microbiome secretes metabolites that uh, impact the immune system. Um, can you just sort of briefly comment on that interface and are you looking at it? Yes, yes. So we, we very much are interested in how the microbiome could be altering the immune cells. So we know that the microbiome have rhythms um, and we know 
Um, interestingly, if you knock out the microbiome using antibiotics or germ-free mice, um, specifically in our, in our T-reg case, you actually ablate those T-reg rhythms. So we know mm. that something that's coming from um, the gut that is influencing our regulatory T-cell abundance. Uh, I know that the IL-2 in the gut in the intestinal flush is rhythmic. So you're getting rhythmic secretion of IL-2 into the gut. Um, so there is something at, at the mucosal face that is really changing um, the systemic uh, availability of those regulatory T cells at different times of day. And we're, we're sort of pulling that apart, but we it's got, it's got to be something that is soluble and that is traveling around because it's affecting cells in the pancreas straining lymph node. Um, and, you know, we're hoping to really pull more information out about you know what are the factors there that are involved in which metabolites is that you know there's been a lot of data showing things like inosine uh, and those sort of metabolites are really important in mm -hmm. driving a t-reg same for things like butyrate um yeah. so, you know we've got a lot of metabolites to look at it's just which one could be the one that uh might be driving the effect that we're seeing yeah you need an army of researchers which brings yes. me to the point that um Emra Altidis uh, at Boston College studies the microbiome pretty heavily in its context of type 1 diabetes, and he has a great postdoc, Kiati Gerdy, Gerder, who is, who is well, um, you know, well versed in that, and uh, I think she is sort of looking for position. So that's a great um, idea, and I will ask her to talk with you. You've got a lot yeah. of accolades in the chat. Brilliant talk, terrific talk. Um, and we've sort of like at the end of our time here. So in the interest of time, I'm going to ask people for their spe specific questions to reach out to you. And yeah. um, really, really interesting. So we cannot wait to see what you do next. And um, congratulations on your excellent funding from the Steve Morgan uh, Foundation and your excellent coordination with your, uh, you know, sort of clinical study outreach. Mm -hmm. Well done. Yeah, thank you very much, Monica. And thank you very much, everyone, for joining and for the invite.